Just for anyone that's new, my name is Ginger. I'm the one who actually puts this together. I'm a real estate agent here at Keller Williams. They let us use this room. So um, I'm really happy about that. You guys have treated this room really well. I just ask at the end of the night, you just tuck your seats in. We'll have an opportunity to network. So kind of pay attention as we go around the room. Uh, we'll ask for wants and needs and there might be a match out there somewhere. So it might be on the whole other side of the room. So just kind of pay attention. Um, just kind of some um, uh, primary things. Uh, the bathrooms are right as you walked in that big entry area. The bathrooms are in there. Um, there's water if you need, you know, if you got a cough or you need some water. There's cups and a water jug. You go out this door, take a right, and then it's the first left. We do ask that you don't go down the hallways. There's people that are working this late. Probably would be me. Come on, can hi. Um, so anyway, uh, my name is Ginger Marfus. I am an investor. I'm also a realtor. Um, I speak the language. So my first year in real estate, I actually had a lot of investors as my clients. Um, I was kind of the condo queen during that time, which is kind of funny because I have some clients that are now selling the condos that I helped them buy seven years ago. And, you know, they bought the condos for like 80 grand and now they're selling them for 280 grand. So nice little profit there. Um, so uh, on that note, um, would you guys like to introduce who you are? If you have a want or need or share or what have you. And then I'll start with you right up here. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. That's okay. That's all right. Okay. Well, my name's Beth Fremont, and I would like to say that the person that you referred me to for changing out the battery in my smoke detector is a wonderful okay. angel. Yes. So he is very good. Yeah. He came in, it changed it right away. I he just and he could get up the ladder. I can't get on the ladder any longer. So yeah, he did that. And I just wanted to give some kudos Good. in that direction. Thank you. I'm glad. Thanks for sharing that. I always like to know that, you know, they're giving me the same, you the same service that they give me. So for sure. And I'm Holly Holweger and I am looking into possibly getting into investing. And so I'm just learning and saving cash. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jason Lynn. Uh, I'm here to learn and keep growing. Uh, Try and get set up so I can get my first rental property established. So that's basically it right now. Awesome. I'm going to jump back to this. Hey, uh, my name is Mike Skandera. Uh, I'm an investor. I have a short term rental here in Reno. Uh, invest out of state in Columbus, Ohio. I'm closing on a property there on Friday. So looking forward to wrapping that up and uh, getting rehab on that. I'm Lauren Renda. Um, uh, like you of these fine folks just here to kind of learn and get to meet some of these people. Hi guys, my name is Maria Fitzpatrick and I'm here just a couple of them. Okay. I don't really know. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name's Alex. I drug Maria along. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I own a company called Rio Area Home Buyers with my partner Wes. We do flipping, wholesaling, buy and holds, ground up here in Reno. Um, I started like four years ago. I actually came to this meetup before I ever did a deal four years ago. And I met the first people that I ever did deals with here. Um, so I'm a big believer in meetups and networking and all that stuff. So um, we're always looking for more deals to buy and more money to buy them with. So if you have any off-market deals or if you're a wholesaler and I'm not already on your buyer's list, please come talk to me after. And if you have any capital Thank sitting you. on the sidelines that you're not doing anything with that you want to put to work, um, we're always looking for more private money to fund our fix and flip deals or buy and holds here. Okay, perfect. My name is Matt Hofer. Four years, I have rental property in San Diego. I have owned since I moved here. I used to live in it. Now that's my home. I'm looking to turn my property I live in now into a rental and buy and hold. So just kind of keep growing as I go. My name is Isabel. I'm a real estate agent and also own a condo. And I'm just here to get different perspectives and network, especially now that the market is showing signs of shifting. Just want to see what everyone else is noticing. Awesome. I'm Josh Panola. 
I'm a, a realtor and investor. Uh, been in New York since '77. Great stuff. I'm licensed for '72, California. Um, these the property owner. I do mostly uh, commercial stuff. We have some industrial properties we bought eight years ago or something. We're struggling to get 50 cents to book for it. And we're ready to have some luck. But interesting luck. Uh, the more I read, the more confused I get. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get that crystal ball out. <laughs> yes, you. Oh, <laughs> I am back. Um, I uh, I started with real estate investing two years ago, um, and uh, I'm just here to learn and get to know you guys and network to that. Uh, what I'm looking for is to connect with real estate agents, lenders, and uh, to know you guys and uh, looking for the next deal. So we have uh, I have three properties under the belt, and uh, we have two Hi, my name is Paula. I'm a real estate um, and I only have one property and it's mine and I live in it, <laughs> but hopefully it'll turn into my first rental. <laughs> Hello, I'm Saul Pino, I'm agent with Ace International. I am here to learn and network. Well, you're going to speak, so we'll ask you. <laughs> I'm Mitch Rivard, I buy properties. I'm Janelle Maribel, um, and I'm an investor currently, and I'm finally working on getting my real estate license. So I was originally looking, I'm still looking to go to EXP, but yeah. um, I also want to see what other brokerages have to offer out there. So I'm in process and my background's already back. So I have until July 21st to seal the deal. So. Nice. My name is Brett Stone. Um, I've been an investor for 20 years. Just moved to Reno like a year ago, so I'm just here to connect with community. Very nice. Uh, Rich Parsons, and I'm this is my partner, um, and we own our house in Demonte Ranch, and um, we're always looking for the next property. I'm also a mortgage lender. Which what are you private or do you cross country mortgage? You ready to come over to you? <laughs> Hello, uh, Josh July. Uh, I'm from Sacramento, California. Uh, here visiting, uh, here to learn about what strategies. You, I don't know the topic. But learn uh, new strategies. Uh, I'm getting my license in California, and I'm um, interested in Reno market for like parking. I mean, for uh, like holding money because California is uh, the politics. Of just uh, yeah, and the numbers don't really make sense. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Oh, wait. <laughs> we have one more. <laughs> okay, we're just introducing ourselves. And if you have any wants or needs, or. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Antoinette. I'm a real estate agent. Nice. Very good. So, um, the market, the real estate market. Any comments, any observations, any um, professional opinions that someone's heard or has? Does well, anyone know about the market? There's still really low inventory, obviously. There's still demand. Yep. Um, even with higher rates. Right. For now. Absolutely. Median price right now is 575 or as of the end of March. We'll have April's numbers in the end of April. Um, oh, yeah. share this um, sorry guys. Forget about you online. Um, let's go back to um Aaron. Would you like to share any wants or needs or what have you? Hi everyone. Sorry I couldn't make it in time from work. I met my full-time medical job and also at the same time working on my full-time real estate job 
So two full-time jobs. I own um, a fourplex here in Reno and a fourplex in Everett, Washington, and maybe looking to 1031 into this market because Washington's tough with their uh, renter landlord politics. Um, and I am also wanting to network and learn and sorry, I'm still having to do it by Zoom, but thank you for doing this, Ginger. <laughs> totally fine we, we're glad that you're able to so zoom's been um, an asset um david would you like to go next sure <clears throat> pardon me david riley i'm a um I'm an investor also recently well not recently a couple of years ago moved to reno and getting back into investing um looking at a couple of different opportunities right now not only here in reno but also in in the midwest um, I'm interested in talking to you, Mike. Unfortunately, I'm not there. So maybe I could share with you my contact information and, and talk to you about the short-term rental that you have now and how your, what your experience has been with that so far. So, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Devin, how about you? Hello, hello, guys. Name's Devin Montesano. Uh, and just getting off work right now. So sorry, it's a little bit loud. Uh, here to kind of listen in, checking on how the market's doing. Right now, I'm just we lost you, Devin. Finally, <laughs> so between five and twenty units. Uh, you're looking for something between five and twenty units. Yes. Awesome. All right, very good. Um, we have a sign in. Um, I, we have an iPad going around for everyone to sign in. Um, if there's anything that we can share with you, um, if you don't sign in, it won't be shared with you just to let you know. Uh, but if you sign in, I promise you we will not spam you because I hate that myself. A um, couple of announcements. Um, I love to give back to the youth in our area. And um, I run something called Quantum Leap, which was started by Gary Keller. And so he designed the curriculum and whatnot. And we're doing the, um, the money portion. So the mastering the basics of money. If you are, or you know anyone that's between the ages of 18 and 28, there is opportunity for possible scholarships scholarship money up to 5,000 and um, free coaching. So highly recommend you 17 kids, what, what? 18 to 28, it doesn't mean you okay. can't come. Okay. So if you're like the ripe old age like me, oh, you have that already? Um, then you can still come. Or if you're younger, you have someone that's younger, you can still come and uh, learn and grow and all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you guys, and I'll let you guys just take it on your way out if you want. We are hosting a shred day. How many finished your taxes? How many filed an extension? <laughs> okay, um, so I filed an extension. My my uh, CPA, she was like, I, go, I think I'm going to have it in this on time this time. It'll be the first time in like seven years. And I was like, I'm going to have it in on time. I promise. I promise. I've got all my stuff in QuickBooks now and blah, blah, blah. And it was the day before, day before, uh, oh no, it was, it was Thursday. So I had plenty of time, but I texted her on Thursday. I said, I think I'm going to need to file an extension. And she calls me and she goes, thank God. She goes, I felt like I was competing with you. She goes, Ginger can do it. I can do it. <laughs> so <laughs> the minute she got my text, she took all her paperwork that she was working on for her own tax return. And she put it in the, in the file to hold off. And she filed an extension for both of us. Um, so, but we have a paper shredding day um, on Saturday because you guys all have come to our investor group. It's free. If you have any stuff that you need to get rid of, come join us. Last year, we had like only a handful of people. So take advantage of it. Um, it's going to be on Saturday between 10 and 2. Saturday, April 25th. So this Saturday between 10 and 2. So you have plenty of time. You can just take one on your way out. How many of you guys got the uh, property management um, 
of me. And uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give it to you and the rest of the class. Okay, so. Um, so we have um, Robert here, and he's gonna, he's actually our property manager of the group. Um, funny way that we met, you guys probably have heard this before, but Robert and I have a mutual friend, and the mutual friend knew I was running this group, and he said, Robert, you should give Ginger a call. Um, she's running this investor group. I think you could really, you know, benefit from it and help them out and all this kind of stuff. So he calls me and he's like, I heard you have an investor group. And I say, yeah, he goes, I'm a property manager and um, I'd love to join your group. And I say, great, we're looking for a speaker. Can you speak tonight? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was so nice about it. He's like, uh, I guess his presentation was amazing, by the way. Talk about on the fly. And I don't remember if it was the same day or if it was the day before. Mm -hmm. I felt did I use some time? Okay, I, like, I always like to exaggerate the story. It gets better every time I tell it. So, um, so going in, let me share the screen here. Let's look. All right, so here we have, let's just look at the market real quick and talk about the market before we have Robert come up and talk about the rental market and being a landlord, trying to run your own um, rental properties and all that. Um, so this gives you kind of a gauge on the market. So like I said, median price point is 575. That's been kind of settled, right? It's been about 575 for about the last two or three months, all right? Um, and I know you work most of south from here. Is that, are you still working like Dayton and Carson? Or you're working everything? Yeah, that's Dayton. Or not yet. Oh, shoot. I thought you were in Dayton. Um, so median price point 575, which is up almost 20% from last year. So, I mean, that's significant. Um, how many of you guys think it's going to continue at that rate? 20%? Yeah. Okay. You guys think it's going to, how many think it's going to increase still? Like, so a year from now. You think it's going to be higher? Okay. Um, how many of you think it's not going to be higher? Okay. <laughs> and why? So why? Why wouldn't it be higher? Why? What? What would make it higher, or what would make it not go higher? Does anyone have any? Less demand, more supply, and that would be right. less. It's the reverse equity. Right. It's starting to be a high demand because we're moving out of California. Many right. Many ways, you know. Right. And they're still building thousands of homes. Right. Still in plan at least. Yeah, there's still a lot of people coming into the area, which supports all the building, and they're still behind, is what I'm hearing. Um, by how many years? What was the last number? Three years. Yeah. Two years was yeah. the last one I heard. Yeah. Labor shortage. Even by the company is building a lot. Oh. Yeah. And you work also for property management, right? Yeah. Yeah. For apartments. For higher end apartments. So um, new listings 587, which is down 7.3%. So um, I honestly think that number is a little bit, I don't know, you guys can give me your, those of you that are real estate agents can give me your thoughts on that. But I believe that we have, um, I don't know, I just think that the inventory is, is uh, getting exposed differently than on the MLS sometimes. We're having a lot more for sale by owners. Mm -hmm. You guys seen that? Yeah. I mean, it's it's not a ton for the area, but it's still increasing. I'm seeing them on a daily basis now. I love all my searches. And people list on like open door. Are you seeing a lot of open door? Not a lot, but it's common. It's just like Craigslist and Facebook. Okay, Even you guys hearing that? Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, look for houses. <laughs> That's where she's looking for how there are people are still posting on Craigslist, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And those are the ones you can get killer deals, I'm telling you. Because <laughs> they probably don't even have the internet. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, they have the internet. They have a, a, a nephew or something that has the internet. Um, okay, so. Facebook Marketplace, be really careful, and Craigslist, because some people are trying to sell um, a house that they don't own. The ha that's huge. It happens daily. So um, just make sure you're not, you know, that you're doing all your due diligence. 
Um, new listings, this is the new listings chart. Um, this is a concern. So March is our top month, March and April, for listings coming out. And um, back in March of 2019, um, we were right at, what would you say that is, about 590, 580? And then March 2022, we're at 587. So we're right, we're right about there, what we were a few years back, three years back. Um, but we were on an upward trend. Uh, unit sold, we can look at that. New contracts. New contracts. Things to contract. This is something that we always look at. Um, <laughs> it went from six days to five days. <laughs> um, if it goes down to four, then you know we're definitely not trending the way that some of us think. So uh, you're a realtor in the area, right? Mm -hmm. So have you noticed that most of your buyers are, are not seeking mortgages right now and instead they are using proceeds from like a sale or from like savings? <laughs> I mean, are people still seeking mortgages at like 5.2? Five, 5. Yes. Oh, so they it's not discouraging them like paying wise or? No. No, no. Um, I do have some cash buyers. I think we all do. Yeah. However, people are still, you know, five percent really isn't that much in yeah. the grand scheme of things. Well, I mean, from three, three seven, right? Like them. So COVID caused the rates to go drastically low, lower than they've ever been. Right? Are they low? Were they lower than you've ever seen, John? And I only ask you because you've been in the industry for longer than the rest of us, <laughs> not because of your age. Yeah, I haven't seen. For a long time, anything under double digits was a steal. Um, yeah. You've know, been in the industry, industry for over 30 years. So You've been in the industry for over 30, so you know. Yeah, well, of course. COVID caused it to go historically low, just stupidly right. low, right? So sure. rates in the fours to fives is still historically low. Yeah. On the grand scheme of things. So five really isn't in the grand scheme of things. It's still not that bad, but it is going to progressively go up. So what's happening, what I'm seeing, and you guys can tell me, is that people are, are still rushing to buy because they know those rates are going to go up by next year. But we're supposed to have, what, two more increases or more? Two for sure. Is it three? Okay. And that's already being built into the market, but because it's not slowing inflation down, then rates are going to continue to climb. And I'll just give you an example of three versus 5%. Um, take me a second. That's big. Give us four, four to five. But like four to five. 400,000, it's like, so like 200 bucks a month. 400,000 is 1909. And then 5% is um, 2147. So that's, so that's $200. 200, call it $240 more. Well, if you're borrowing 400,000, you're affording, you're not, that's not changing your buying scheme, right? For $240 a month. Our property taxes are lower than California, you know, and our insurance, right? So, Good point. so the thing about Washoe County versus anywhere I've ever lived and done mortgages is in California, when you buy a property, you, you pay one and a quarter percent of the purchase price so that may affect them, but for us, we inherit the seller's tax base and goes up 3% a year. So you don't, $250 or $240 for someone isn't a big deal, especially right. when they're coming from California. So just for anyone that's not following that, the older the home, the older the tax base. So you can get a home that you're only, you're paying less than $1,000 a year in taxes on. I think you have a couple of those, right? Yeah. You're paying very little on ta in taxes. And, you know, in California, it's a totally different situation. It doesn't matter how old the home is. And most states, we're very, very it's unusual. Very and we hope it stays that way, all of us investors, because that's that's part of where we're getting some of our cash flow, if, if you could find something with cash flow, um, is because those tax rates are so low. So that's that's actually discouraged some some clients, not all, some clients from buying a brand new home because the tax right. basis. Because isn't it like 1.1% or something? There is a mm -hmm. formula for, for new homes, new builds. Yeah, it's, just, much, it's a percentage. Right. Yeah. Which is much higher. Um, 
So anyway, so yeah. Um, so median home sold price, we told it, we talked about that, and active inventory was a big one. And I should just use this thing. Okay, active inventory. Um, see, active inventory is up, but we have less listings that came out in March than a year ago. Whatever. <laughs> Month supply of inventory. Um, we already talked about that. And all of this information is on rsar.net. It's free to everyone. You can go on to rsar.net and pull these up. It usually takes about a week for them to post for the previous month. So for April, it, you'll have to wait at least a week into May for them to post that. And then they give a nice little synopsis here you guys can read. So, but I'll let you guys go online to get that. Um, any questions, any thoughts? I didn't bring my crystal ball. I still think, go ahead. No, just a comment on mortgages. Um, I don't know about owner occupied, but I'm trying to raise some financing on a fourplex. It's three points. It's expensive. I mean, there is no, there is no car. Yeah, it's changed a lot. So I mean, I was looking at, so I, I have a uh, just a uh, um, 1031 investor who is exchanging and we're going to do it after the fact he's paid cash and we're going to go get a mortgage after the fact and i looked the other day and it was six it's a it's a single family it was six percent it's a low loan to value conforming loan amount and yes it was above par so fanny freddie has really just gouged second home and what they're trying to do is is discourage investors because they want people to be able, in my mind, to, to be able to buy primary residence versus investors. So that's what's being pushed right. onto the investor and discouraging you from borrowing money, which- um, Which uh, your strategy that you have back there, that's, that's the strategy that's working the best financially because you can get owner-occupied homes, right. you know, renovate, move on to the next one for a much lower rate. Yeah. Exactly. And, but for the investor, they're either paying cash or taking, hoping they can get, you know, six, 7% return on their money to offset the mortgage, right? So that they're taking out now compared to when I was doing them a year ago at three and a half percent. I see. Five and a quarter. I mean, the interest rate isn't bad. Points and garbage fees, it's five percent, five and a half percent, junk fees, not junk, yeah, points yeah. and junk fees. Yeah, you know, so I'm getting a $71,000 loan and it's, and it's costing me three grand in points and almost another two in they call them junk fees. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, well, <laughs> so know, holding cost and whatever. I'm sure so, you got the terminology. Yeah, I, I don't want to. Yeah. yeah. So, what questions. are some ways, and not to discourage using you as a lender, I'm not trying mm -hmm. to, but owner this is an investor's financing. group. Owner financing. Yeah. Owner financing. Well, where else are you going to get good money on your return right now other than do it like someone owned it outright? Yeah. You get 4% from somebody. That's a yeah. return. Exactly. And, both sides are happy with that right now. Yeah. You're right in the middle. I don't know about 4%, but yes, I'm going to agree with you on well, that, but saying, maybe not the number. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be happy for a 4% loan and he should be happy because he's not going to be able to put three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars anywhere and get 4% return. What's the other benefit of, sol of owner financing to the, to the seller? Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, you're not being taxed right away. You're being taxed monthly because uh, it's right. monthly payments right. over a term. So some of the people that are trying to, you know, um, liquidate their assets, that might be a better benefit to them because they still have income coming in um, that's not, you know, one big lump, you know, of money that they have to pay taxes on that year. Installment sale. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, yes, John, please. Is, yeah. You got someone to talk to. We have a, a um, commercial building. It had a bar in it and a tattoo shop when COVID hit. And so we said, told our tenants, don't worry about it for three months. We'll put it on the back end. But 
in our Bloomington. Um, I was able to call the lender, private lender, and say, here's what we're doing for our tenants. Will we make half payments for the next three months? I said, sure. Wow. Try that with B of A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be like, John who? <laughs> so it's just having, having a, a live body on, you know, that you can talk to or whatever happens, you know, you know, he's your roof right now or yeah. something catastrophic happens. You got the opportunity to talk to him and say, here's what's going on. Can you help me? On the other side of that, the general horror story about, you know, the not like from people I know, just from researching. So mm -hmm. how do we avoid that with lawyers? Like what yeah, it's just having really good contact. Have a real estate lawyer that re that reviews your contract that represents you. You want someone that represents, you know, all of us want someone that represents us, you know, and make sure that they write it, you know, that it's hopefully favorable to everyone, but that it protects you. But yeah, real estate lawyer. And Heather's come to our group. She's um, Robert actually was the one that introduced us and now Heather and I are good friends. Yeah. So she's write, written all my uh, tenant agreements, all that stuff. And she's caught some things that she's like, Hey, this could really open you up to, you know, X, Y, Z. We just need to add this one little phrase in here and it protects you. So um, yeah, I would just have someone that knows what they're doing, draw it up. So you don't run into problems later. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a cost, but it's, it's also going to save you money down the road. Hopefully she shared something. Actually, she's in my BNI that, um, she invited me into and, um, she shared on the screen. She, um, someone had a contract. I don't remember if it was, tenant, I don't think it was tenant related, but, um, oh no, it was job related. And, um, this gal was told one thing in her contract, it read a certain way. And all she would have had to do was add one little phrase at the end of the sentence. She goes, you should have come to me when you went to sign this contract with your employer. And so, which cost her like 65 grand in a year. So it was a, a pay raise kind of thing that 65,000 a year for not going and spending, you know, whatever, four or $500 for an attorney's um, help. Yeah. It's in the now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 565,000, <laughs> anyway. Um, anyone else? Questions? Yes. You can use, uh, what does it use? A mortgage broker. We've found some mortgage brokers that they've become more competitive, even uh -huh. with like non-traditional like lending or non-conforming loans because of the extra points that Fannie and Freddie are adding on. Yeah, because they can reach out other there is a whole world of people that lend money yeah that aren't um they don't have as many strings attached to them or rules or regulations but you should know what you're doing if you're dealing with them but they, yeah they do good work yeah that's that's a really good i love that so mortgage broker that can reach out to multiple different types of money and they have access to private money too that you know we might not have be privy to so um anyone else any suggestions um so uh like i said robert's here to share with us his wisdom and i we would like this to be interactive right we want them to ask questions okay <laughs> we'd like yeah, this to be, to be <laughs> we would like you this to be you, you texted me like two o'clock <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It's getting worse. Next time it'll be like right as you're walking in the door. Hey, Robert, uh, which he has done before. Um, so I appreciate that. And I, I think we're all curious about the rental market, um, what your perspective is on that. And then um, I had an agent in our office, his, his mother-in-law, um, just recently, I referred him over to Robert and he was very impressed with you, by the way. Um, his mother-in-law is 85 years old. And she owns this condo. It's the last of her properties that she has, or two condos in this community in Sparks. And she is 85. This is the only income she has coming in, probably besides Social Security. I don't know. Anyway, but she, um, so she owns these properties and she's very um, um, frugal. And so she has, and she's had bad experiences, I think, with some property managers that weren't doing what they said they were going to do. And 
you know, she just didn't see the importance. And so now it's him and his wife or his wife is on the property with mom-in-law and they have, they have quite a few assets in their portfolio. I just know him as a friend. I know that, you know, they have something that if someone was to go after. So we got to talking and I said, please tell me you have that in an LLC. And he was like, um, we did. And then mom didn't want to pay to have it in an LLC. So they switched it over to, you know, her personal name and my wife's name. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys need to switch it. And then he was talking about his mom and how she was having trouble with the tenant that she's had in there for years and is paying half what she should really be paying. And she lost her job a few months ago, apparently, and she hasn't been paying the rent for the last two months and she changed the locks. So he's like, Ginger, what do I do? Do I call a real estate attorney? Who do I call? And I'm like, call Robert first and he'll let you know if you need to get a hold of an attorney. He knows what he's doing. So, um, you know, I'm sure you've dealt with something like that before. Um, and you've probably rescued someone and then, you know, they're clients for life, hopefully. But um, so anyway, so I appreciate that. And if you guys have any questions, definitely fill them in. I'm just turn on you. Um, I'm Robert Hughes. I'm the broker owner of PMI Reno. Uh, we've been in business here for seven years now, a little over seven years. My wife and I moved here, started this business, uh, well, nothing to do. I didn't really ask me to speak, surprised me to speak when I was coming here. I had five doors. I couldn't manage them at the time. And we currently have about 400 and we'll continue to grow. Uh, we've got a team that helps me and, and, and manages our properties. And I like to think we do a very good job at what we do. So there's a there's not good property managers out there. And um, I want to believe that we're a different kind of property management company and how we communicate, how we manage the funds and manage the property. So, but uh, love, to, love to have questions and visit with you, with you more on that. Um, so she texted me about two o'clock, I get. Well, maybe two o'clock is when I saw the text and, and it wasn't <laughs> till about four o'clock before I had a chance to sit down and call. But uh, so uh, I've been here before and talked about different things that you need to focus in because you guys are may not have a property manager, you manage your own properties. But one of the key things that you got to know is even though you're not a licensed property manager or, or licensed real estate um, agent, you're still liable to NRS 118A, which is the law, tenant and landlord law. And just because you don't have a license, you, but you still have to follow that law and you could still get trouble with fair housing, you know, how you handle tenants funds to anything that could lead to fines oh, potentially up to, well, they could start out at a couple thousand dollars on up to 10 to, I've seen things in the, the was it Nevada that the real estate board board puts out a quarterly newsletter that lists all the bad behavior agents out there and not agents and how much what they did and how much they would find um it's good reading good motivation to stay uh, on task so it doesn't have non in there too i so think i've seen some i think so okay the last one i read was it was a it was a property management company or maybe it was a broker broker died and a daughter kept running the business for a couple of years signing checks well over three hundred thousand dollars of fines so anyways don't want to scare you <laughs> invest just know what you're doing so um i was thinking about the talk about and one of the things that we face and i think you guys would face too is when when you have tenant, tenant turnover and how do you handle a deposit and really wanted to kind of focus a little bit on, well, let me talk about the, the market report first. We won't get into that. Let's see if I can do this. So, see if I can use this thing right now. 
So we, we use a, a market analysis uh, from Rent Range. Um, that's a company that pulls data of rentals in, in every market and of the different size of houses and, and things like that and kind of gives you a kind of a estimate of what rents are. Um, the trends are continuing to go up. Um, we get the, it, the reports are based on, let's see, uh, yeah, the first I pull get, get by zip code because we're pulling a specific address. But the key thing to kind of look at, you know, over the month, we're still still increasing. Three months change and then, you know, 12 months change, $100 increase on average for rents in the Reno market. So rents are still going up. Um, I'll tell you that we tend to be a little on the conservative side, not being too high. We'll start high and then come down when we price things. <clears throat> but we've been, when we use this report, we usually dive a little deeper and look at what else is on there. We'll go to Zillow and see what people are pricing things, run some numbers on, uh, you know, price per square foot and kind of get a good average, get a good feel of that. So, but the rental market's still climbing. I keep thinking it's going to settle down a little bit and, uh, and flatten and it hasn't quite yet. So I, but that's me thinking that, you know, I, I think it's going to slow down a little bit, but I think we're going to still see rent increases and it's still going to grow. We're still pushing, I think we're still pushing the, um, the limit of affordability, but that's the same thing with housing. And I think the rents are going to follow that same, <coughs> excuse me, that same trend. So, okay. so any questions on that? Uh, I, I got a question in, uh, in terms of uh, just uh, on the back page uh, rental trend uh, summary. So, uh, in the state of Nevada, really, uh, uh, the 12 month change is like two, 230. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, uh, like and seems, I'm going to tell you, it's is not, that pretty normal? I mean, no, not so, really, but it's it's not so much Washoe County, Northern Nevada that's driving that number. Las Vegas has seen oh, a drastic Vegas. increase in the real estate value in the, over the past 12 oh, months. Oh, and Reno actually went down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Re Reno, it's Reno's uh, $93 has gone up over 12. It's, the zip code you're looking at. Oh, yeah, okay. the zip code is, and every zip code is a little different. So, yeah, sorry for distracting. No, that's okay. Not seeing those numbers like uh, is like, it's not just inflation, it's just su supply and demand. Uh, well, it, it's a supply, supply and demand issues, one of them. And you know, we've had a little bit of trend wreck in March. Um, you know, our rent, rentals turned a little bit slower. And I went to Zillow just to kind of see what's going on. And there was a ton of purple dots in Reno. There was a lot of properties coming up. And it was a lot, what I figured it was a lot that we're coming off of COVID. People are starting to clean house. So there's a lot of rentals that are coming up. And usually if it's cleaning house, some of those people are not, it's harder for them to get properties because they're being cleaned out because of moving problems there, but there was a lot of rentals up in March. It's it's thinned out somewhat from April. Do you have like the national numbers? Like uh, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. I try to focus on Northern Nevada. <laughs> but I, I would say generally, your most markets as a rule. Rents across the nation are going up. Yeah, at least ten percent minimum. Yeah, well, and it tends to follow a little bit of the inflation, whatever the true number of inflation is. If you look at the seventeen percent that it would really is to compare to what they really report, but mm -hmm. you know, that's a whole other conversation there. So. <laughs> Same with unemployment. <laughs> so, but uh, anyways, yes. Uh, 
Um, of all the doors that you have in the sparks, are there particular neighborhoods that you see have less vacancies or attract better tenants? Um, I don't look at those numbers as closely. Overall, um, we're pretty consistent on vacancies. You tend to have more vacancies in multifamily properties, um, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, more so than houses. Because right now, uh, a three bedroom, two bath, up to four bedroom, three bath, uh, they don't stay on the market very long. Those, that's where this market is short in supply. There's a lot of one bedroom, two bedroom apartments, condos out there. And so what I've seen is those kind of stick on the market a little longer, but we're still not having a problem right now. So. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to. Just go to the paper. Just imagine that's your computer. So, it's just bigger. It's the computer, I can touch the screen. Yeah. Well, maybe I shouldn't let you look at this, but uh, so I, I figured I'd talk a little bit about um, when you're moving people out. What do you guys consider as normal wear and tear? I'll look at the screen. No cheat. <laughs> What's that? Five to seven years on carpet, keeping it in quality. Two to four years. Yeah, but when, when you look at when you go back into your property after a tenant moves out, you know there's there's rules and kind of standards of what what's considered wear and tear and what's not. What what do you charge the tenant? You know, uh, and I've had owners where you know like, there's a little bit of wear on the carpet. It's like that carpet's got to be replaced. I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but you know, what what is your thoughts on it? Things that are just really like dogs or something they weren't supposed to. Yeah, people still. Broken things that you should talk about, like broken closets, cabinet doors that are basically easy to fix if you call right away, but then not easy to fix after you just leave them for something. Yeah, it kind of falls in what's not where normal wear and tears tend to neglect. You know, you're talking, carpet's a good example. It, it, a typical rental carpet lasts five to seven years because typically you don't put the premium carpet in a rental. Um, we recommend that you don't go cheap, cheap, but you know, kind of a cheap to middle ground that gets you about five to seven years. And so you got a tenant in there for two years, new carpet when they moved in. When they move out, you would normally expect to see traffic patterns little bit of wear where they sit in front of the couch, maybe a little more if that's all they do is sit in front of the couch, but you know, um, you know, things like that. But if we walk in and they're, you rented the place to them with carpet that is a light brown, that's standard rental property brown, and you come back in after they moved and it's black, that probably not normal wear and tear. They didn't, probably didn't, pull it apart, they didn't burn it, but they just never cleaned it, never vacuumed. Um, and believe it or not, there are people that live that way. And we like them gone as soon as we can. So understanding, you know, cause you're, when you're managing your property, you are responsible for the tenant's money, which is the security deposit. And you understand that that money is the tenant's money, not yours. It's the tenant's money that you need to keep separate from any other funds that you have. I, I don't know. That's that's real estate law. That's uh, no, the, not commingling funds. But you got to keep that money separate. You can't spend that money <clears throat> typically until they move out, and then you have a reason to charge them for that. And and this kind of what I want to talk about is how do you determine what do you charge a tenant and what do you not. And that comes into the concept of what's normal wear and tear. You know, big holes in the wall. Not typically normal wear and tear. Actually, it's not normal wear and tear. <laughs> but holes in the wall for hanging pictures. Is that normal wear and tear? No. It depends on the contract. Many. 
What's that? It depends on the contract that they signed. It does depend on that, but in general rules. If they've been there for more than two years, a couple like pinholes ain't that bad because I mean, paint will cover that. I mean, well, paint is two to four, I heard. So, like, if they yeah. Yeah. how does it depend? I mean, well, it just depends on. Well, obviously, it depends on the tenant, but typically it's it's because uh, I mean, paint is yeah, there's low quality, which is basically just water, but I mean, most paint is latex, and I mean, you gotta repaint with it. And, and this is just a tip yeah, never use flat paint in your rentals, <laughs> do a, a satin or semi gloss, it'll last longer, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, the typical life of paint, two to four years, but if you've got a tenant that's been in there for 10 years, you know, that's a different story. That's a topic for another time. But, you know, when you go in there, say the tenant's been there for two years and it was freshly painted, again, it's kind of come, what do you, how do you determine if there's scuffs on the wall, how far does it go from uh, some scuffs on the wall that it's normal wear and tear, or it's, you need to charge the tenants. The holes in the wall, we got, I, I think I heard four different answers on it. And, and so what I'm getting at is you gotta, there's gotta be a standard that you use and it's gotta be a realistic standard because when people live in there, when you live in your own house, you know, you're gonna hang pictures. You're gonna have scuffs because you're moving furniture. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have traffic patterns in your carpet. Things are just by nature going to break from use. And, and those things that are normal wear and tear and break, you know, a, a toilet valve wears over time typically are the owner's responsibility. But holes in the wall, the toilet bowls cracked. Um, black pat, pat, you know, traffic patterns on the carpet are not normal wear and tear that's showing that you know the tenant's not taking care of the property. Well, so, the, sorry, if the carpet's like seven years old and like they really abused it, do you charge them or because the carpet life is basically over, you're like, oh, I'm gonna put new carpet once they leave? It depends. What was the condition of the carpet when they moved in? Well, I mean, isn't rental life five to seven years? So five to seven years. So if um, if the carpet's like eight years old, but it was in decent shape, but now it's like not repairable, not cleanable. Not yeah. This is this is a it, this is kind of a tough topic because yeah. it, there's so much variable, and, and um, but like on the carpet, I mean, so you're at three years when they move in. Uh -huh. And the carpet's pristine because the previous tenants took great care of it. So there's a little bit of a judgment call there that that life of that carpet's probably going to be extended because of the care of the first three years. Okay. And you return in two years and it's black. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, you know, it's a pro. It's a prorated amount that you would charge if, if possible. Okay. And you charge based on at least we look at it with the prorated. What where is it in the life? And was there tenant neglect to do that? So I think I think this topic we can open a can of worms and go into details yeah, that sorry. <laughs> we could be here all night and I don't think we want want to, but and they're that's a good question. Don't, don't get me wrong. I but uh, what I want to get at is you know Nevada NRS 118A talks about normal wear and tear. Well, they don't say tear, but they normal wear. And the gist of it is, you know, you can't charge the tenant for things that wear out under normal use. So you can't charge them for replacement of a carpet or paint if it has the age and it's normal wear and tear and it's just time for it to be done on that. So, and sure. A couple hundred dollars. Yeah. You never know. They can. They can try. 
but this is kind of the topic what I'm trying to talk about what really what I want to get to is consistency of how you do these things and have something in place that you follow when you're doing this so when you're consistent in rating what's normal wear and tear and what you do and what you charge the tenant it'll help you and there's a couple other things because really this conversation is how do I how do I stay out of the courtroom and how do I not have a tenant trying to sue me yeah Sorry, Aaron online wanted a question. Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm renovating and putting in quartz countertop and LVP flooring. And um, so one of the questions is if the quartz gets burned or stained, is that damage or wear and tear? And the other is same thing with LVP getting like big scratches in it. How do you know how many scratches or how deep the scratches? And the security deposit doesn't pay for replacing a quartz countertop usually i don't think i can charge them that big of a security deposit so how are you guys handling newer finishes um it, it's usually by a case-by-case -case basis i mean it if it depends on how bad the damage is um we'll try to see if we can get it repaired and charge them what it costs to get it repaired um if the uh burn mark or the the scratch isn't that bad. You know, we've looked at possible some charges for it, but it can also be, it, it, again, it's a judgment call, but it's, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> but it's, it, we kind of take it by case by case and depending on the damage of, I mean, the damage in, is, uh, is superficial and it, if it can function, then we may charge the tenant a little bit for the damage of it and, and move on. Um, if it needs to be replaced, which we have done that before when we charged the tenant a, um, a cost to replace it and factored in the life of whatever has been, been damaged and charged them a prorated amount. I hope that kind of answers your question. Aaron, thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, is it standard for PMI to remove and remove out checkers? Uh huh. Yeah, I'll actually show you what we do. Yeah. So, but anyways, I kind of want to put. I wanted to put up here that you know this part of NRS that to understand what the wear and tear. So, how do you do that? Well, you have standard expectations what what where normal wear and tear is and you you're consistently following it and secondly you communicate that to the tenant so they can understand what normal wear and tear is and what you're looking at because it's one of the key things when, when doing anything but with tenants especially is managing expectations if they know what you expect most of them pay attention to those details not all of them but most of them do so let's see So we use a, I get it open. We send out tenants when it comes time to move out. We also have a lot of the same information in, in our tenant, a tenant manual that we send out to them that talks about wear and tear. We give them cleaning tips. I mean, we, we try to spell it out as much as possible, what we expect there. But we send this out when they give us notice or when we give them notice, kind of gives them an idea of what they need to do. We tell, <laughs> we tell them, hey, this is what we want you to clean. And this is how you do it, what to look at. Come on. So it just kind of breaks down in there. Yeah. And then we have a section I just, we define, hey, what we look at as normal wear and tear and what is, what's not and that you're gonna be liable for. And so we go in, I think fairly good detail on that, on that. And then we just kind of got a little sheet here that gives them examples. So holes in the wall, they had like 
three different answers. Well, we defined it. You know, we want something smaller than a six penny nail. Anything better, bigger, you're going to be responsible for us to patch and paint it. You know, faded paint, you know, spot, pat, spot painting, patching. If they try to do it, they'll touch up and they decide to use flat paint on the semi gloss that we put in there, they're going to be responsible for that. You know, faded caulking is wear and tear, missing caulking around the tub, and, and damaged caulking that, that shows that they're just not taking care of the place because they don't clean and the mildew is eating the caulking away. That's not normal wear and tear. They don't they're not taking care of the property. Um, you know, hard water deposit happened, but if they, if they don't clean, again, not cleaning, there's going to be mold, mildew, and, and major stains. That's not normal wear and tear. Worn out keys, you know, is, it happens. Broken or lost keys, not you, the owner's fault. So, um, you know, broken, missing locks, you know, go, we go through worn, you know, normal war traffic patterns, patterns. Um, same thing on floors, you know, if there's tears, rips, and holes, there's a place that you can possibly charge the tenant for the repair of that. So, so I, don't, I, I don't want to go through each one of them, but it, if you guys would like a copy of this, um, go ahead and grab one of my cards and shoot me an email, and I'll send you a copy of our standards and what we look at for normal wear and tear help you with that so any questions so far on this for one uh so this is an issue with uh so i live in rental and uh the landlord they just put uh for the lawn they just pulled out the grass and they just put some cloth and like a little bit of gravel but we're having like grass grow like crazy uh -huh. who's responsibility would that be like because like they didn't do it correctly they just put tiny fabric and uh rocks i mean and like every time we pull weeds like there's a simple answer to that contact the landlord or no it's okay. simple answers what, what was the condition of when they moved in well it was just gravel no weeds but then like they didn't do it properly so yeah how but Again, it goes back to what was the condition of it when you moved in. That's the expectation of it. So this is kind of you. You help yeah. me lead right into the next step. Oh, thank you. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, you set the the standard again. Managing expectations. You set the standard that when they move in, what's the condition of your of the property when they moved in? For that, what you're saying there, yeah, maybe the landlord did didn't even put any weed barrier in there. Just do rocks on there. Tenants still, if it's in the lease that they're supposed to maintain, tenants still responsible to make sure that it stays and is returned in the same condition outside of normal wear and tear. And we always say same or better conditions because I have no problem if the tenant wants to make it better as long as they're not doing something we don't want them to do. But uh, but it's is that the condition? So how do you prove that? Pictures. Pictures. Move-in report. So the the uh, real estate um, RSAR has a standard little move-in checklist that they can fill out and write some things down. Um, how many of you guys use something like that? Do you take pictures with it? Absolutely. Good. Yeah, because it's more important, I think. Oh, it is. Because without pictures, pictures, you know, the old adage, pictures worth a thousand words. I mean, it's, I've had a, a situations that tenants come back and say, why are you charging me for this? And we didn't do that. And all I did is pull up my move-in report and move in out, I move out report and I sent it to them. I was like, this is why. And they look at the two pictures and I hadn't heard from them since. <laughs> and if you ever have to go to court, the judge is going to ask, well, why are you charging them? I'm like, we haven't been because we don't want to be in court. 
Um, so we do things ahead of time to make sure we stay out of that situation. But if we did, all I have to do is say, that wall move in didn't have that hole in there. The wall has a hole in there now. That's why we charged them. So, so we use a we use a report a system that uh, we take on our phones that goes into property, and I, I've got a comparison report here because we can do that. But when we go into a property, <sighs> get there. Anyways, it goes through each section. You know, so the entryway, it's really is probably not the best example. Let's just go. Yeah. It's going to jump all over the place. So it goes in by each room. And, and so we don't use the standard real estate checklist. We don't, we don't want to use that. If the tenants want to do that, that's fine. But we, we offer the tenants to use the same app. We send them a link that they can do the same thing that we do. But we always go in before they move in and do a full move-in inspection, which we go by each room, by each type of thing, and mark if it's satisfactory, new. Even if it's on move-in, there's sometimes there's things that are might be damaged that we want to note, but we're not going to fix. But we want to note it so I don't ding them on the way out. So we do that, and, and then we, we actually use a 360 camera that gives a full view, full view of the, oh, this is not gonna cooperate. So we can, we can see every inch of the, of the room. So we know, you know, if, if that mirror's broken or missing, we're gonna know when we have a full condition. But the key thing for you, if you're using a software or a 360 camera, or you're just doing it on your own, take a lot of pictures, document it, make sure that they're time, time and date stamp. Um, we have it where they are location stamp. How do I get rid of that? How do you find these things? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. I lost my train of thought, but you uh, have the address on the photo. It's on top of the photo. Yeah, the address. address on the photo. Yeah, the yeah. So, and the, and the address so but the photo shows the address. Yep. Um, as you can see at the bottom, for us, we have the location and time all that there. So you want to document there, and so you want to take a lot of pictures out and move it. Um, no matter what type of system you use, you want to take a lot of pictures, and then when you do the move out. Don't do it with the tenant in place. It'll take longer for one thing because they're going to say, well, they're going to tell you every story about why something's damaged or they didn't do it or it was some mysterious thing. Do it without them so you can freely look at the place. I typically don't go in and do the move out after I, I, I don't review the move in before I do the move out. I just go in with a clean slate of, I'm going to mark everything that needs to be marked and take pictures of the condition of the place. Then I take it back, which we have the capabilities with this report to do a comparison side by side, whether it was move in, move out. And then we go in and go back to the, our rules that we have of what's wear and tear and what's not. And put our punch list together of what needs to be fixed for the turnover, and then mark whatever is going to be a responsibility of the tenant for the deposit. So, so my, my ending thing with this and, wear, and with wear and tear and when we're doing this, documentation is key, lots of pictures, um, and have a, a solid standard rules that you follow every time. Because if you do have to go to court, it's a lot easier to say that, hey, this is why 
this is what it is. This is why we do it. This, we've done it on every other move in and move out that we've done. This has been our standard operating procedure. And the SOP stands out when you're dealing with legal issues. If you're all over the place, the judge is going to wonder. So, uh, first off, I really like that he has the 360 photos. Uh, yeah. So, I have a question for you. So, um, let's just say you're managing you know, your, your, your client's property, right? Uh -huh. And uh, how do you uh, prevent you know, stuff from like breaking your headboards? For example, um, this. Uh, yeah, um, so let's just say um, do you check the, the property like every few months or every six months and see if you know how's the condition of the property for example mm -hmm. there's like a mold build up where you know, the tenant it's not saying you know there's you know there's this thing happening that kind of thing to prevent like the issue from getting big that kind of thing. We do. It depends on the plan that you have with us. Um, mm -hmm. we'll go well for sure we always go once a year when renewal time comes. But uh, we have other plans that we go twice a year or three times a year we'll go in. And when we do go in, we do a, we do a property check. So it's not a full report like this mm -hmm. uh, because when the tenant's in place, you know, there's a certain rule in there that it's, they gotta have quiet comfort. So we don't really go in and dive into every little corner unless there's a reason and respect them. We don't take a lot of pictures during a, a periodic inspection because there's personal property there, but we'll always document things that are not normal, red flags. So if there's a dog bowl sitting in the corner and they're not supposed to have pets, we're gonna take a picture of it and then probably send them a warning letter or a violation letter on that. So, but so it depends what plan you have. And we go in, we like to go in with the tenants there so we can ask questions. And then we take a look at key things. One of the key things that we take a look at is we're always checking the water heater because we've had a situation where the tenant wasn't watching it and it leaked and then we had a closet full of mold that the tenant's responsible for because he never told us. And the, the cost for him is about, I think we're about 12 grand for the repairs. So we might end up in court on that one, but. Uh, he, we, well, not for the repair of the water heater, but because the water heater was leaking and he didn't report it, there's damage to the floor because he didn't report it. There's mold all through the, the closet where the water heater is at because he didn't report it, the mold's there. So those things are his responsibility. The water heater is the owner's responsibility because the water heater is break. So... But isn't there like a life to water here and like would it be the homeowner's responsibility because the water here was so old they should have replaced it prior to the tenant? No? No. I mean, no if if the them. water heater the water heater has a life they say and you get some years. people say 10 years or 15, somebody say seven. You know, what's the official rule there? But when the tenant moved in, the question was, was it leaking? No. Was it functioning? Yes. And you as an owner, just because it might be getting up to that supposed age, you can replace it as a protection, which is probably not a bad idea, but are you required to replace it? It's not broke. Don't fix it. But you make a judgment call on what the risks you want. And, what, and as a property manager, they'll advise you too on it. Um, I gotta tell you that my house, I've got a water heater that I think, I can't remember the date, but I, I'm pretty darn sure it was put in about 92. And it still functions. And I don't dare clean out the sediment because it may stop functioning because I don't wanna replace it because new water heaters. Replacements are now in the $2,500 where a year ago was about 15. Okay. So that's a good question because that was a question. That was the, one of the arguments that the tenant made. Like, well, you knew it was old. You should have replaced it. If it's functioning, not leaking, it's not. If it started leaking and you failed to tell us, 
Isn't there usually a tray that's, but that's before the code, so it would be grandfathered. No, I mean, like, usually there's a tray under the water here that they put there's in. Usually, and when that water heater gets re replaced, yeah, when it gets the tray has to go in, the expansion chamber has to go in, and everything has to be brought up to code. Okay. So, yeah. Again, you know, you don't want to replace something you don't need to, but you might keep in mind of certain things, especially if you have a unit that's on the second floor and you don't, and it bursts, you're not only responsible for the damage in your unit, you're responsible for the damage in the unit below. So you weigh out the weight risks, so. So the damage? The, the, the damage. I mean, the the damage. Lieutenant, we have, a, we have an addendum and, and a couple other places in our lease to talk about that. So on the case of this example that we're going through, there was a bunch of mold. We had to take out drywall. We had to replace floor. Um, the mold addendum covers the, the mold. If they fail to tell us about the leak and mold develops, they're responsible for remediation. If they there's a leak and there's damage from it because they didn't tell us it, it's tenant neglect, they're responsible for the damage. So, again, we have those things in, in our, our lease to make sure it's very clear. When we go sign leases, we try to communicate that with them and manage those expectations. So, What do you do when you have a tenant that and it's probably in the lease if they smoke in the unit? I know you got to repaint, I'm sure, but yeah. getting that smell out is so charge for that remediation that, as well as there's like it's all of our units are non smoking unless the uh, you, the owner, tell us that you want to allow us to do it, allow them to do it because we're going to advise you against it because smoke in a home damages everything the HVAC system, the flooring, the walls. So, what we do on those type of cases is yeah, we might have to paint. There would definitely be more cleaning. Um, we're gonna have to use an ozone machine to help try to get that smell out. All those things will be charged to the tenant because it's a violation of the lease. But when the, um, the fees of the damages exceed what the deposit was, do you end up, it's a lawsuit basically? We haven't yet. Not yet? But what we do, <laughs> what we do is if it goes over, the deposit amount, we send out several notices saying, hey, with the report, because you have to, when you do, when you do charge against their security deposit, you have to itemize what you charge for. You got to back it up. So it can't be an emotional thing of the place is dirty. I'm going to charge you a thousand dollars because I had to go clean it. You got to, if you're going to do your own work in there, you better put a dollar value of how long it takes you per hour or the price per hour. What you did, if you do some repairs, you better have some receipts. Because if you do have to go to court, you got to back it up. And if it does go over, you know, we we send several notices out over, you know, over probably about three months or so. Say, hey, you're over the bounds. You owe us this money. If you don't respond, we're going to send you to collections. Now, we don't want to go to collections because you get about half, if they do collect, you get about half, but you weigh out, it becomes a business decision. You know, if it's a low dollar amount, it's not worth going to small claims court because you're gonna spend a, a good $500 at least to go through that filing process. Um, but if it's a high dollar amount, then you probably wanna do that, so we work on it. But keep in mind, if you have to garnish their wage, wages, every, no, I can't remember. Every certain time frame, you have to file another form, pay another fee to get the garnishment going again and keep it going. So, so like if they quit their job or go yeah. get another job. They disappear. And time. if they disappear on you, you got to do a skip trace. You got to find out where they're at. Collections is an easy way. You send it off. And we received, I mean, we just got to check some money from somebody that we... We didn't even manage the property. We didn't manage the property for three years. Um, they moved out. They had the balance due. We send them the collections. 
they're trying to either buy a house or rent another place. They can't because they owe us money. And, and, and as a landlord and as a property manager, if they owe a landlord money, don't put them in your place. <laughs> Right, because you'll be the next landlord that they open uh -huh. to. If they break leases on a regular basis, don't place them in your place. You know, I'm trying to think what other ones that we just we just automatically, yeah, old landlord, old landlord money, eviction in the last seven years. Um, bankruptcy is, is a gray area, but yes, it would could hurt them. We look at their credit behavior. You know, we don't like to see consumer debt, not paying their credit cards or power bills. Medical, we don't really pay much attention to because that's a whole different ball game there. So. Yeah, uh, I have a question. So got a tenant that's uh, right now, the contract is month to month. Mm -hmm. So right now we have to kind of do repairs, get the insurance involved. Uh, luckily the deductible was able to be used mm -hmm. to do all the repairs and whatnot. Because the contract is month to month, can we make adjustments uh, to um, mon not monitor, but be able to do inspections like more often like quarterly or whatnot to observe wear and tear, things of that nature? Because it's month to month, yes. can you make that adjustment, I guess, is yes. the question. You as an owner or a landlord or property manager uh -huh. can enter your property any time as long as you give them proper notice. And that's a 24-hour notice. Uh -huh. And if you're going to be doing as much as you're talking about doing, you better post it on the door. You better email it to them. You better make sure that they know you're coming. Uh -huh. But I'd advise you against being excessive to that because you got there is a law in there that you get it. You rent the property to them, you've got to be required to give them quiet comfort of the house. Because mm -hmm. if you basically turn that property over to them, it's theirs to live in and, and have quiet enjoyment. Mm -hmm. But when they misbehave, mm -hmm. you can start making some exceptions, but there's one exception you can is you just can't show up and enter their property anytime you want. You can't really can't go in, enter with proper notice outside of normal business hours, I think that's inappropriate. Is that traditional hours or just within reason? I mean, I would say within reason because a property property manager, you're working sometimes. Schedules and whatnot. You just can't show up and say, hey, I'm gonna be there at midnight <laughs> after hours. If it's Saturday, it's a, because that's the time you got, if you give them proper notice, no that's fine. I would always encourage you to, go in and do this when, when they're there because you minimize your risk as, as opposed to entering the property when they're not there. And, then, and if you already have a rough relationship, but they could say, hey, something's missing. You did da this damage. You know, the he said, she said thing. You just want to protect yourself. It's a, there's a lot of CYA in taking care of your own property. And a lot of it comes from documentation. So pictures. Okay. Pictures, documentation, and consistency. You know, do the same thing with every tenant, with every property that you do on the main core stuff that you're doing with it. Okay. Anything else? Just one thing, it we can we can do move in and move out inspections for you. We can offer that to you because. You don't need to. You don't need to give us. If a tenant's not there, we can come and do a move in or move out inspection, utilizing utilizing our tools um, for you. Um, we would charge 150 each time we do that, but you would get a report like this emailed to you. With, I mean, each picture you can go in and see it big and, and use it. It's in a nice report on that. So. You would charge me 150 dollars. 150 bucks. If if you want me to do that, yeah. Once the tenant's gone, I just need to have some way access. We'll go in and do the full thing with 360 pictures. Obviously, we'll have no opinion about what the tenant did or didn't do. We're just going to document everything and provide you with the report, and you can take it to compare it to with whatever you have on moving. So, is there a time frame? 
um, from when a tenant is either removed, evicted, uh, moves out, whatever it may be, to doing a report and like, is there a time frame? Obviously, you can't go, oh, two years later, hey, you did this. Or, but like, is there NRS's a yes. time frame? Okay. You have, once the tenant moves out and turns in the keys, and the keys can, turning in the keys could be a great thing too. So another consistency thing is make sure that you get, when they turn the keys, get, get something that they can sign that they've turned in the keys so everybody can recognize, hey, this is when I turned in the keys. But the, the rule is, is you have to send the tenant their security deposit funds that you're returning and an itemized list of how you spent that money if you did, or if you spent it all, you still got to send them how that money was spent. It has to be sent to them within 30, 30 days. I highly recommend that you send a certificate of mailing so you have proof that you mailed it. Uh -huh. So another thing that backs you up if you ever have to go to court. Uh, 30 days after closing of that is roughly... 30 days of the rule would be the hard set rule. I can't see the wording in the law, but Basically, when you know that they vacated it, it, it and agreed, you both know that that's when it was vacated, keys being turned in is the best way to determine that. Okay. And that's how we use the rules that, hey, you, you tell them. Again, managing expectations. You must turn the keys in so we know that you have vacated the property. And, and that's when the 30 day time starts ticking. We always try to get them done within 20 to 25 days. So if there's ever a bump in the road, we have an extra time to make sure we follow that. If you don't, you could potentially be sending their, no matter what, sending their whole deposit back and possibly more. So you wanna make sure you follow that. Does that include like damages? Let's say your contractor needs an extra week or two longer than you were hoping? This is always the challenge. Right because sometimes contractors and handyman can't get in there as quick as they need to. And that's why it's always good to do a, maybe two weeks before, do a quick walkthrough to get an assessment of what the place is like to know. So you can start lining your contractors up because you got to meet that 30 day. You can do estimates. I don't advise you, but we do because you, you just sometimes you just can't get the cost. You got to get it done in that 30 days. You got to have some sort of cost. We do an estimate. We, we tell them that this is an estimate and give them the reason why. And if the estimate come, if the actual cost comes in less, we'll send them more money back. Cost them more, we'll weigh out how much it was. And if we need to, we'll send them a bill. I have another side question. Sure. So um, right now we have repairs that are being made in a rental property. Mm -hmm. So we're communicating with the renters and the contractors. Mm -hmm. So we can get everything done. Tenants are still living in the unit. Okay. And now everyone's communicating well. The question, is there any kind of liability where like, hey, um, because of repairs, uh, uh, tenant or landlord have to lodge by certain code of conduct while repairs are being done, um, yes, I would say it's a loaded question. I know it's a loaded question because it, 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 it depends. Here's a good lawyer answer it depends. Um, as a general rule, you if you got a contractor working there and the tenants working there, communications key, okay, um, making sure things are deadlines are being met. Okay, um, if the work, make sure that the works don't step outside of habitability of the property. So if the kind of work they're doing is causing a lot of dust or a lot of, you know, challenges to the health of the tenant, okay, okay. you may have to address that and be mindful of that okay. and protect the, protect the tenant. So mold is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. We've had to go in to do mold remediation on the property with the tenant in place. Using the proper vendors is key. Mm -hmm. And then they need to protect the area, make sure the proper ventilation so that when they're doing the work, it's not getting into the living area. 
okay. of the property and, and your your good remediation places will do that okay. very well. I think that, that kind of gives you a general idea of what you need to do. To make sure you communicate and then yeah. everything is for safety yeah. and, and try try to get it done as quick as possible. Okay. So you're not inconvenience the tenant as much as possible. Yeah. Sometimes there might have to be some concessions. Okay. But that, that answer is depends. Okay. You know what what's every tenant's different. Okay. If I were a renter and there's something happened that wasn't my fault. Wasn't really the owner's fault. This needs to be fixed, mm -hmm. and it's been an inconvenience. Hey, I'm going to work with them and get it done. Uh -huh. There's all tenants out there that, oh, you inconvenienced me for a day to have my garbage disposal replaced. I need your rent credit. Mm -hmm. The answer from us would be no on that. But you're going to meet those types. So. Okay. I need to wrap it up, don't I? Sure. All right. Any other any other questions? I, I I can stay as longer if you want. I only lost one person, so. <laughs> uh, question on rent comps. Is there, do you know of a, a source that we can pay for that gives you actual rent comp data, stuff that definitely, this unit got rented for this amount? Because right now, when you go on Zillow, Hotpads, Apartments.com, we can see what's for rent, but, and then we assume like it was listed for 1400, it's gone. We think it got rented for 1400, but we but don't, you don't know. know. And that's the challenges that uh, when I look at things, I try to look at a lot of different ways. Um, in this market, there's not. Your best resource would be the MLS. But in Reno, I think 5% of the agents use MLS yeah, for rentals. And, and that's the only place where it's, it's recorded. And they still have to go in and update but they rented and there's no guarantee that they do that. Um, what I do is I kind of look at what is the market being listed at? I hate to say it, I, I look at Zestimates. I don't trust it, but I look at it in a way that, okay, where's my estimate sit to the Zestimate? And I try to, in most cases, be right around that or under it because your typical renters thinking this estimate is the word of God in the prices, and it's not, but that's perception. So you're you're doing a marketing thing there to watch that. But if I but if I see that the estimate is low compared to what everything else I see, I'll ignore it and price it where it needs to be. And I tried to price it a little on the higher side, and might be probably not as high as as some people may feel it could be because I am a little more conservative because I believe that it's better to get the property rented quicker than hold out for 50 bucks or hundred bucks for a month. Cause you'll never make that money back in a year lease or two year lease holding out for one month for an extra 50, hundred bucks mm -hmm. and vacancy costs. You're still paying the vacancy costs. Um, you also want to make sure you know, best you can have good tenants. And if they're good tenants, you want to try to keep them because Turnover costs are one of your most expensive costs in running your property. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Question. Sure. So, um, what do you charge for property management? I know you said you have two. So, what's the range? Of I, I range between eight to twelve percent. Okay. And all the services that there's the same services is just structured differently in how you pay for it. Um, it averages out to be about ten percent. Okay. Of the rent collected, we do rent collected, so if the money doesn't come in, we're not getting paid either. So we're tied with you on that. So we don't have a flat rate either, or we don't have a vacancy charge. We work with you, and we want we want a place a place with good people. So we don't want to mess with bad people. Yeah. yeah. So, but, so uh, upon your services, um, if you needed to get a placement for uh, fair market value for the rent. Uh, screening the tenants is that something that is that they you do. provide as well? The leasing your... service, correct, correct. Yeah, so we, we, we do that, okay, and we'll, we'll market, show, screen, place the tenant, collect the first month rent deposits, okay. and fees. we'll pull our fee out of that, and then turn everything over to you. Next. Okay. 
So those will be two separate. Yeah. So we do. We have just a strictly a, a leasing lease up, what we call it lease up service, where we find a place to tenant for you and then turn it over. Okay. And you you do the management ongoing, or we do the full management. Um, and these documentation itemized. So, e so turning it in uh, for tax purposes. Uh, yeah, I have, have all that stuff for you in the process to do that. Oh, okay. And then uh, say leasing leasing service will include one of these reports and everything. All right. I think we need to wrap it up. But uh, if you have any more questions. Um, Give me a call. I'm happy to answer and uh, help you out. So, Thank all right. You. Thank you. Thank you.